Thank you, Andrew. I think uh, the little boy in the opening story um, that I'm going to share with you this morning probably sat in one of Des's uh, classes, you know, one of those Easter times where the guy comes up and he shares about why the, why the egg is empty. Uh, he was a little guy called Philip. He had Down syndrome. He was about eight years old, and so every Sunday he would go to Sunday school with his peers, but they never really accepted him. Always thought he was a little odd, a little strange, wasn't quite getting what it was that the teacher was, was asking him to do. But there was a creative teacher, and so she decided to, to do something with her class, to teach a lesson, much like Des did. Uh, to teach them a lesson about Easter and hopefully in the midst of all of that to embrace uh, the truth of Easter and of course to embrace little Philip who was really struggling to fit in. And so what she did was she went into a cupboard and she found those containers. I was unaware that there were such containers. Apparently uh, there are. Uh, they called le eggs or legs. I looked up how you pronounce that. Couldn't find it anywhere. So we'll, we'll just say legs. Um, they were these containers that actually contained stockings, not eggs. And on the Sunday that they were celebrating the resurrection, she gave empty stocking containers that looked like eggs to all of the students in her class. And she said, what I want you to do is I want you to go out into the church garden and I want you to find something that's living and put it in there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to come back into the Sunday school class. You're going to put all of those containers on the table and we're going to open them up. And it's going to be a surprise to us every time uh, we see what is in there, what one of the others has has put in there. And so with the chaos that ensued, the kids ran outside into the church gardens and uh, they started catching butterflies and grasshoppers and worms and leaves and little pieces of grass and putting them in those empty containers. And as they put them out on the the table and, and the teacher opened them up one by one, you could hear, ooh, and ah, and until they came to little Philip's container. And as he opened it up, there was nothing inside. It was empty. And so what the, what the teacher had sought to achieve actually backfired because the kids looked at this empty container. Theirs it all contained something that they felt had kind of met the mandate, but little Philip's, well, it didn't contain anything. And, and so they said to him, Philip, that's stupid. That's not fair. Someone didn't do their assignment. And he said, that, that's mine. And they continued, Philip, you don't ever do things right. There's nothing there. I did so do it, Philip insisted. I did do it. It's empty. The tomb was empty. And silence followed. And from then on, Philip became a full member of the class, embraced by the children. And sadly, he died not long afterwards having contracted an infection that most kids would have just shrugged off. And at his funeral, the class of eight-year-olds marched up to the stage, much like the kids did this morning, not with flowers, but with their Sunday school teacher carrying empty stocking containers. Young Philip was right. The tomb was empty. The tomb was empty early on Sunday morning when Mary Magdalene, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Salome the wife of Zebedee went spice in hand to anoint the body of Jesus. In fact, the fact of the empty tomb is so significant that every writer of the Gospels writes about it. All three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as well as John, speak about the empty tomb, and they focus on certain details. They bear in mind their particular audience, they contemplate what it is that they want to emphasize, and they hone in on those details. And so when you read any one account, you don't get the full picture, and you certainly don't get that with John. But that's where we're going to be this morning. We're going to be in John chapter 20, uh, reading a number of verses in that particular passage, but we're going to be dipping into those other Gospels as well. 
And here we start with the empty tomb in verses 1 through to 10. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Verse five, he bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth, the cloth was still lying in its place separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. So John tells us in the first verse of that passage that early in the morning before the sun had risen, while it was still dark, around 5.30 a.m., and it struck me when I got up this morning to read over the message again that it would have been around that time in Jerusalem that these events transpired, but around 5.30 in the morning, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and she saw something that unsettled her immediately. The stone that had been placed in front of that tomb was no longer there. And neither was the body of Jesus. Now friends, she wasn't confused about which tomb he had been buried in. She'd been there before along with Mary, the wife of Clopas. They'd been there before. It wasn't like she got lost, as some skeptics say, and that all she needed to do was to find the right tomb, and there she would have found the stone still rolled in front of the entrance and the body of Jesus still lying where she had put it. She wasn't confused. She knew where it was that she was going. Besides, this wasn't an ordinary tomb. This was a tomb that belonged to a rich man, and not just any rich man, a guy by the name of Joseph of Arimathea, who is like the elite in the political and religious system of the Jews, a member of the Sanhedrin, right up there in the Jewish council. And he had asked, he'd asked Pilate if he could take the body of Jesus down from the cross. And so we read in Mark 15, verse 43 to 47, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Most criminals hung on the cross, uh, sometimes for days at a time, as we indicated on Good Friday, and the, the Roman soldiers would break their legs to hasten the death. That never happened to Jesus. Uh, Jesus died within a number of hours, six hours that he hung on that cross from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., but Pilate was surprised as a result to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. He wanted to make sure. So he wanted to make sure that they had actually executed him properly. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb, certainly he didn't do it by himself because as we're gonna discover in a minute, that, that stone probably weighed about two to three tons. And there was a, 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 a slot in front of the entrance that it would have been rolled into. But that stone was placed there, then he rolled the stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. They saw it. I know that when you're grieving, or when you're distressed, or when you've suffered a significant loss, sometimes you can lose focus. But I'm sorry, I don't think that within the space of three days you're going to forget where your loved one was buried. And Mary hadn't forgotten. She'd gone to that tomb, the stone was rolled away, and Jesus' body wasn't there. Both Marys, as well as Simon, Peter, and John, by the way, in case you were wondering, who's this so-called other disciple? That's who it is. It's John. He was being modest. 
He didn't want to say that he was the one that Jesus loved. He didn't want to say that he was younger and faster than Peter and made it to the grave first. So he just refers to the other disciple. But both Marys, as well as Simon Peter and John, the other disciple, went to that tomb and they were fully expecting to find the body of Jesus. Friends, if there had been a plot to steal the body of Jesus, the two Marys, Peter and John, weren't part of that plot. They were expecting to find the body of Jesus there. That's why they were surprised when they got there and the stone had been rolled away and the body was missing. They weren't part of any so-called plot. They were genuinely surprised to find that stone rolled away in an empty tomb. As I indicated, not only was it a heavy stone, but the Roman governor, Pilate, whom you'll be familiar with, had said that that stone needs to be sealed. What he meant by that is if that seal is broken, it hasn't been done with my authority. It needed to be sealed and it needed to be guarded. And we know that guards usually made up between four and 16 Roman soldiers. They took turns so that they didn't fall asleep. Another really bad excuse that was used by the people when the body of Jesus went missing. Four guards in turns taking shifts to guard that tomb. In Matthew 27, we read, The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. That's rich. This last deception will be worse than the first. Do you understand the level of deception that had taken place to execute Jesus? I pointed out on Good Friday that the Jews had broken 20 of their own laws within the space of a couple of hours to make sure that Jesus actually went to the cross. But they're talking here about deception. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Well, as I pointed out, John was either younger or faster or both than Peter. But they ran towards the tomb, which they had now heard reports were empty. And John got there, but he didn't go inside. I have no idea why. Didn't go inside the tomb. Perhaps he was afraid of what he might discover. But he didn't go inside the tomb. But Peter, in typical fashion, you know, just brushes right past him, barges past him, straight into the tomb. And the texts tell us that both of them, as they looked into that tomb to begin with, saw these strips of linen. No body, but strips of linen were there, the ones that Joseph of Arimathea had wrapped around the body of Jesus. And then they went into the tomb, and they saw these strips of, strips of linen on the one side, and they saw separate to that the head cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. What was the curious thing about the head cloth and the linen? Well, the head cloth, cloth was still lying in its place, exactly where it had been wrapped around Jesus' head. As for the linen, the same thing was true of that. The Holman Christian Standard Bible says the wrapping that had been on his head was not lying with the linen cloths, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. Now, I don't expect that you good people have ever been in a place where you've wanted to steal something, but I bet that if you were, I bet that if you found yourself in a place that when you wanted to steal something, you would not take the time to make sure that everything was left neat and tidy before you left, before you escaped. That's what happened in the tomb. This was not the work of grave robbers. Folded head cloth in place, Linen separate from that. And our text tells us that when John, who eventually did go into that tomb, surveyed the scene, he thought to himself, there's only one thing that makes logical sense here. Yes, I know it's supernatural. 
Yes, I know this isn't something that we expect to happen every day, but there's only one thing that makes sense. Even though it's supernatural, it's the most logical explanation. He's actually risen from the dead. He's actually risen from the dead. As Sue pointed out, he told them that he was going to do that. Three times he told them that he would have to die. Three times he told them that he would rise again, and the last of those occasions is found in Luke 18, verse 31 to 34. Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. Did you notice that? Everything that was written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. In other words, what he was doing is he was pointing them back to the Old Testament and said, guys, it really should be unnecessary for, you, uh, for me to tell you this because you, you should already know it. It's written in the Old Testament. You guys should know that the Son of Man is going to die and that he's going to rise again. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, they will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. Had to be handed over to the Gentiles because the Jews weren't, uh, weren't uh, empowered to execute him. They will flog him and kill him, and on the third day he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. Why was... It's meaning hidden from them. Was God hiding it from them? Did he not want to know? Of course he wanted them to know. He'd written all about it in the Old Testament, about his death and resurrection. It was hidden from them because they weren't willing to see it. They were wanting a king. They wanted to be liberated from Rome. So they couldn't perceive in their minds that somehow the Son of Man was going to die and rise again. Just couldn't get it. And so it was hidden from them because they were deliberately blind to it. Didn't hear what he had to say. Didn't see what he was indicating. Those Old Testament prophecies, you can find them in Psalm 16 verse 10. Psalm 22, you can find it there. Daniel chapter 12 verse 2 and 3, you can find the prophecies about Jesus. Isaiah 53, which we heard on Good Friday, verse 10 and 11. Until they stood in that tomb, those prophecies about Jesus, those reminders that he had given them, didn't make sense. But in that moment, as John walked inside and the body was missing, and he saw the head cloth on the one side and the linen on the other, he got it. All of a sudden, he got it. And the text tells us that he believed. Let me ask you a question. Do you get it? Do you get it that the tomb was empty? Do you get that it was a supernatural event, but honestly, if you look at it from a non-biased perspective, the thing that makes the most sense is that he rose from the dead. It's the thing that makes the most sense. No, Mary did not get lost and go to the wrong tomb. We've established that she knew where it was. She had someone else with her. In fact, there were two women with her at the time. They knew exactly where it was that they were going. No, the disciples, the disciples, the disciples who were willing to lie to a young servant girl because they were so petrified of what would happen if they identified as followers of Jesus, those disciples, Peter in particular, they didn't all of a sudden develop courage to overwhelm the Roman guard, trained killers that were standing there, muscle away the three-ton stone, break in to the tomb, unwrap the body of Jesus, put the linen neatly to one side, the head cloth neatly to the other, and then escape. That wasn't them. It was never, ever going to happen. And no... Even if they did pull for the body of Jesus, even if they did um, steal the body of Jesus, they would never have taken the time to make sure that things were left neat and tidy. The tomb was empty for one reason. He had risen. Do you get it? They got it eventually. 
took a little time for it to get through to them, but they got it eventually, as did Mary Magdalene. John got it, Peter got it, the little boy Philip in our story got it, and then Mary Magdalene got it. She was the first post-resurrection encounter that Jesus had. We read about it in verse 11 to 18. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Do you know that this is the only time in Scripture that the angels are sitting? Every other time we hear about angels, they're doing something else. But on this occasion, they're sitting. They're sitting down in the tomb. Why? Because it was finished, just like he said. Price had been paid for sin, accepted by the Father. The deal was done. The angels were sitting down. They didn't have anything else to do at this point. They were seated, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Verse 15, he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. I mean, out of all the people that Jesus could have appeared to first after he'd risen from the dead, he appeared to a woman. And not just any woman, but a woman who, according to Luke chapter 8, had had seven demons cast out of her. And as we hear that, we might think to ourselves, what is the consequence of her gender? Is that of any importance whatsoever? Friends, I'll tell you what the consequence is. I'll tell you what the importance is. If the disciples were going to fabricate a story, in other words, if they were going to fake it until they make it, when it came to the resurrection of Jesus. If it didn't really happen, but they wanted to spread a story that it had and they wanted that story to be believed, the first person to encounter the resurrected Christ, or at least the one who spread the story, would never have been a woman. Why? Because in that strongly patriarchal society, they didn't accept the testimony of women. They required not just one, but at least two, even three men to share the testimony. And so if the disciples were going to pretend that something happened that didn't actually, that's the way they would have done it. Jesus knew those prerequisites, but he still went to Mary Magdalene. He still went to a woman. Ladies, I hope that's, that's an encouragement to you. I mean, in the midst of two cultures that were incredibly patriarchal, the Romans and the Jews, The resurrected Christ appears to a woman first. Clearly, he didn't deem women to be second-class citizens like the Romans and the Jews did, and some people still do today. He went to Mary. Now, as you read those verses that pertain to Mary and Jesus' encounter with her, the, the emotion's almost tangible. You can really sense what it is that she's going through. And I think that at least in part, it's because of what she'd been delivered from. Seven demons had at one point possessed her. I can't even begin to imagine what her life must have been like, the torment she must have suffered, the deeds she must have done as a result of those demons which were indwelling her. Maybe that's why she was the one that was as devoted as she was to Jesus. It's often been said that if you've been forgiven much, that the love that you show towards the one who forgave you, 
is greater. But when those two angels in the tomb asked her uh, why she was so distressed, why she was crying, her response was telling. Listen to what she says. They have taken my Lord away. My Lord. Not just any Lord. Not the Lord. My Lord. See, Mary Magdalene had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. She didn't just recognize him as God, she'd accepted him as her God, as her Lord, as her master, as her Rabboni. And I don't know where they've put him. Mary was talking about her Messiah. I think it's important for us to pause at this point in time and acknowledge the fact that maybe you here today and you came here under some duress. Didn't really want to be here, but you came anyway. Well done. And maybe you, you're sitting here and, and you feel a little uncomfortable in church because you don't really feel like as amazing as he might be that God could love you, that he could forgive you, that he could save you. In fact, when you contemplate the sin that's in your life, when you contemplate what you've done, historically, you think of yourself as thoroughly unlovable, unforgivable, unsavable. Friends, must I remind you again of Mary Magdalene, seven demons had possessed this woman. But God loved her. God forgave her. God saved her. Do you remember the, the verse that Des read on Good Friday if you were here? If you weren't, I'll remind you of it. Romans chapter five and verse eight, one of the greatest verses in all of scripture. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, I think a lot of people think that when they come to God, when he draws them and they come to him, that they need to be clean, that they need to clean themselves up. That's not your job, that's his job. That's why you need him in the first place. Because we are sinners, separated from God by our sin, in desperate need of a savior, a perfect one. We can't offer that. But he did in his son, and he demonstrated that the, that the sacrifice was acceptable by raising him again from the dead. Have you taken that step of admitting you're a sinner, believing that Jesus died for you, was buried, and rose again? Have you taken that step of faith? Maybe you think to yourself, I'm, not, I'm still not sure. I know you read that verse in Romans 5, verse 8. I know you're telling us about Mary Magdalene, but you just don't know what I've done. I think I might be out of reach. I think I might be unredeemable. Well, then I want you to listen carefully to this, this video clip and this testimony. in a prison in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Every Monday night would go there. And I first would go into the cell of a man in protective custody who kidnapped little boys, sexually abused them, and murdered them. And after being with him, I would go into the basketball gym to play basketball with the other inmates. And they would come up to me and say, hey, Cliff, how can you even talk to such a piece of dirt? Don't you know what he did? And I say, yes, I do know what he did. Pretty horrendous, pretty grotesque, pretty evil. But he still is a human being, created in the image of God, and God offers him forgiveness, as horrible as that is. Now there's a part of me that doesn't like that, because I've never kidnapped little boys, sexually molested them, and murdered them. So I think I'm better. No, unfortunately I'm not better. Because in my own sophisticated, erudite way, I have rebelled against God. I am in desperate need of God's grace, his forgiveness. And for me to look down on a guy like that and say, oh, you're just so inferior, you're just a piece of dirt. No, he's a human being created in the image of God. That image has been horribly defaced, horribly. But he still is a human being created in the image of God and God offers him forgiveness. 
oh, that's cheap, Cliff. No, when you look at the cross of Christ, you understand that's God become a human being who sacrifices his life on a cross. He's the eternal God, as you were pointing out so accurately, George. He is all-powerful. He is eternal. And that he would become a human being and then go through the hell of a cross so that I wouldn't have to go to hell. Wow. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Mary Magdalene was, uh, was in for a pleasant surprise. She was distressed to begin with. Stone had been rolled away. The body wasn't inside the tomb. Uh, she looked inside, she saw the angels. The angels asked a question, why are you crying? And then she saw a man who she presumed was the gardener. And she turned to him thinking that he might know where the body of Jesus had been taken. And she, and she was asked the same question by the gardener as the angels had. Woman, why are you crying? And then Jesus added, who is it that you're looking for? Who is it that you're looking for, Mary? And we might ask that question of you this morning as well. Who is it that you're looking for? Or maybe let's turn it a little bit and, and say this, what is it that you're looking for? What is it that you're looking for? What is it that you came here for today? What is it that you're trying to find? Mary says, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And then Jesus spoke her name. I wish I was there to hear this. Mary. You know that same voice that had at one point cast out seven demons with her and spoken with power and authority speaks on this occasion with compassion and kindness and gentleness and empathy. Mary. And immediately she knows who it is. This is not a gardener. This is her Rabboni. This is her teacher. This is her master. This is her Lord. This is her Messiah. And, and she reacts like Mary would with, this, with a sense of devotion that she had. And she immediately grabs onto Jesus. Wouldn't you do that? I mean, she'd lost him before. She didn't want to lose him again. And what does he say to her? Mary, don't cling to me for I've not yet ascended to the Father. See, he was still functioning on the Father's program. Still according to the Father's purpose, the Father's will. Mary would have kept him there forever. Mary would have prepared the throne upon which he would sit to rule and reign as king. But he was still doing the Father's will and telling her, to calm down because the time would come where they would once again be together, but now was not that time. And so Mary, undoubtedly with a tinge of sadness, but yet bursting with excitement inside, because she, she had seen the risen Savior, speeds off and tells the disciples the good news, I have seen the Lord. And it's those self-same disciples, minus Thomas, for some reason, he wasn't there, don't know what he was doing, but there were only 10 of them there at the time. It's those same disciples that have the next encounter with Jesus, and we read about them in John 20, verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Not in the way we do in the New Testament, not in an indwelling, but in the Old Testament form where the Holy Spirit would come up upon people and empower them for service and with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. <coughs> Excuse me. When you read John's account, it kind of seems like this is the second encounter, right? I mean, the first one was Mary Magdalene. Now, now Jesus is encountering the 10 disciples. But if you read the synoptic gospels, you find out that this is actually the fifth 
encounter. After Jesus had encountered Mary Magdalene, he met with a group of women. Then he met with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Then he met with Peter. And so Peter and John, who had already come to that place of belief, are in this meeting of 10 disciples when Jesus, out of the blue, appears to them. Windows closed, doors locked, terrified of the religious leaders, of the Romans, and yet Jesus somehow appears in the midst of them. The 10 were actually meant to be in Galilee. They were meant to be in Galilee, so why weren't they in Galilee? That's where Jesus had instructed the woman to tell them to go. Maybe because they didn't want to listen to the woman. Maybe because they were still skeptical about the testimony that they were giving. But the bottom line is they were disobediently sitting in a house in Jerusalem when Jesus had told them to be in Galilee. And he appears to them in that house miraculously and suddenly appears to them in Jerusalem. And Luke tells us, Luke says to us that when he first appeared in their midst, they thought he was a ghost. They thought he was a ghost. I mean, first they didn't want to believe that he'd risen from the dead. Now they're seeing him, but they think he's an apparition of some sorts. And he knows that. And so he says to them, what I want you to do is I want you to feel my hands. And feel where the nails were. And I want you to feel my side and feel where that Roman soldier thrust the spear into my side and make 100% sure that, that I was dead. And believe it or not, but they are so amazed, so overwhelmed by what's happening in front of them that Scripture tells us that they still don't believe. Again, Jesus knows. And he says, give me a piece of fish. And he eats it. It was almost like he was telling them, guys, you felt my hands. You've put your hand in my side. Ghosts don't have flesh and bone. And then he was telling them, ghosts don't eat. They don't eat anything, never mind a nice piece of fish. They don't eat anything. And so finally, these disciples begin to realize, hey, this is how Messiah, he really has risen from the dead. You know, as I read this account, I couldn't help but think to myself about the grace and the patience that Jesus showed his followers. Incredible. Over and over again, as many times as they needed to hear, he clarified for them. Three times we already spoke about the reality that he had spoken about his death and spoken about his resurrection. They'd heard the testimony. They'd seen things in that empty tomb and yet they were still at a place where they were not fully believing and then finally they got it. But the grace of God in the lives of these individuals is incredible. The one opportunity after another that he offered them. And so I've got to ask you, how many opportunities has he offered you? How many more opportunities is he going to have to offer you to come to that place in your life when you finally recognize Jesus Christ for who he is, the Son of God, God in human flesh, who came to this earth to die on the cross for your sins and rise again? How many times? How many opportunities will he give you? And as I pointed out, on Good Friday, no, I cannot present you with a resurrected Christ so that you can put your hands in the places where the nails were driven through his and you can put your hand in his side. I can't do that for you. You can't see him eat a piece of, piece of fish. You can't do that. But according to the words spoken to the disciples in verse 23, and I want to read that for you again, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. That certainly doesn't mean that 
we who already believe have any authority to forgive your sins or not forgive them, what it is saying, because that prerogative belongs exclusively to God, what it is saying in those verses is that if we present you with the good news of Jesus Christ, if, if we tell you compellingly from Scripture that he died for your sins, was buried and rose again, you have a choice to make. And the choice you have to make is whether you are going to accept that truth or whether you are going to reject that truth. And if you accept that truth, then we have the right to say to you, your sins are forgiven. And you are heaven bound. But if you choose to reject that truth, then as followers of Jesus Christ, we can tell you, sadly, your sins are not forgiven. And you are elsewhere bound. Bound to a place of eternal punishment and, and torment. In the one instance, you're counted a friend of God, in the other, an enemy of His. Friend, let me appeal to you please don't let another Easter go by. Yet another opportunity for you to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ without receiving God's gift of salvation to you. But we're going to wrap up our encounters with Jesus in this passage with one last fellow. He's quite a famous guy. His name's Thomas. And maybe he's a, he's a good description of where you find yourself right now. You know what they call him, right? Doubting Thomas. I mean, he demonstrates to us in this passage that he, he, he had his misgivings about what everyone was saying. And, and now the number of people that were testifying of the resurrection had grown on this occasion, all the other disciples are there as well, but, but Thomas is kind of center stage. Peter believed. John believed. In fact, all of them believed. All of them had come to a place where they believed. But Thomas hadn't had that opportunity yet. And so we read in verse 24 to 29, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Yeah, Thomas didn't say, I can't believe. He said, I will not. It's a matter of the will. I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. They still weren't any bolder or braver. And Thomas was with them, though the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he directs his attention to Thomas. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God, then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. See, Jesus practically replicated the previous experience for Thomas. Same thing. Allowed him to do the same things. See, Thomas, flesh and bone, you said you wouldn't believe unless you could put your fingers in, in my hands and in my side. And Thomas does it and immediately, boom, he knows. He knows. But Jesus spoke really important words to him before he believed, before he said, this is my Lord and my God, before he proclaimed Christ as his Messiah. Stop doubting and believe. See, Jesus' final words in our passage are directed at this audience. Not just this audience, but audiences across the world, audiences that weren't there at the time. See, what did Thomas have? Thomas had sight. Thomas could see the Messiah. Thomas could touch. He could feel. He could experience right then and there. But we told, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Friends, there's no one here that's seen. No one here that's seen the resurrected Christ. But on the basis of the testimony, of scriptures, on the basis of the testimony of others, on the basis of changed lives, on the basis of the truth of God's word, we've not seen. And yet, we've believed. 
If you're sitting here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, then may I encourage you, exhort you with the words that Jesus spoke to Thomas. Stop doubting and believe. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this day. Lord, we are beyond thankful for Good Friday. Uh, that day, Lord, that was triumphant and tragic. As we pointed out, triumphant because you were willing uh, to send your son to the cross. Triumphant because your son was willing to go. Triumphant because he did that to the point of death. Triumphant because he took our sins upon his shoulders and paid for them the full price. Tragic because the world loved darkness rather than light. Tragic because it was an extreme injustice. Tragic because today still so many hear that message and prefer the darkness. But Heavenly Father, today, Easter Sunday is a day of triumph. The tomb is empty. Mary Magdalene saw it. Father, the disciples saw it, and Thomas finally declared it to be so. And Lord, we know of many other witnesses at the time that Jesus appeared to that told the same story. Why, oh, why would they have told that if it was a fabrication and then be willing to die for the cause? Father, I pray for that man, that woman, that young person that's here today who's never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and in him alone. And ask Heavenly Father that as they've heard the story of the crucifixion and the resurrection, Lord, that they would contemplate its truths and be like Thomas. Stop doubting and believe. And Father, I trust that if there is someone here today who's never done that before, Lord, that they will take the time, a short few minutes, to come and speak to us afterwards because their eternity is at stake. Father, thank you again for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Just got a few quick announcements before you leave this morning. <laughs> Firstly, uh, next weekend we are holding our Life Step 1 class. A reminder that if you've been visiting for a while or you haven't yet decided if you want to make Stanton Bible Church your home church, we encourage you to join us at Life Step 1 where we will introduce you in a bit more depth to the things we believe and give you an opportunity to ask the questions that you might have. No commitment is necessary before coming. Come to the class, bring your questions, and after that you can decide if you want to make Santa Bible Church, your home. Then our AGM, we announced, uh, I think last week, that it's for the 14th, but it's had to be moved to the 28th of April. Uh, we've posted the names of the elders and deacons who will be standing, so you can check that out before we have that AGM. The AGM, we will present visit, vision, we'll also go over our finances, and present the elders and deacons who will be serving for the next year. It will also include a bring and share lunch. We will give you more details about that. It will be after the second service on the 28th of April. So just uh, set that afternoon aside, please. And then lastly, lastly, there we go. Um, we are holding a blanket drive as part of our 40 days of prayer, which will be starting in May. But we want to get those blankets in now so that we have the warm blankets for those who will be cold, even though they might not be cold yet. That's why it's happening so early. So please get out blankets that you don't need. Please buy blankets if you need to buy them. Also bring in clothing. We'd like to get those to those who need them before it's too late. Thank you so much for joining us. We pray that you'll have a great week in the Lord. And we'd love to see you next Sunday. If you've been visiting for the first time, join us again. If you're a long time attender, bring someone along with you.